Good morning. Welcome to our services today. It's good to see your smiling faces as we've come together to worship a risen Savior. If you're a guest, there is a yellow sh tag in the uh, front of the, on the pew in front of you. If you would fill that out and let us know of your presence. That's also for anyone that needs to turn in a prayer request. That way I'll get it to our prayer team. We've come together to seek the face of Christ and be changed. Let's turn our attention toward the risen Savior. join our hearts in prayer. Dear Lord, 
we thank you for the privilege of being in this place of worship today. While we may take this opportunity for granted, help us to be mindful of the many in this world who are forbidden. We gladly surrender our lives to you in worship and praise, and we invite your Holy Spirit to move freely among us. Please come dwell in our hearts. Equip us, challenge us, comfort us, and teach us. Inspire us as we strive to follow you. We are forever grateful that you love this world so much that you gave us your only son and your promise that whoever believes in you will not perish but have eternal life. Lord, we adore you. We love you. You are so precious to us. For it is in your name that we pray. Amen. friend Larry came to me one day and he said I want to show you something and so he pulled out this thing you've probably seen it before have you ever seen one of those No. and it was and I couldn't figure out what it was and so sometimes something unexpected happens you think look when you do that look oh what gosh, happens look at, look at that. but it looks one way and then when you yeah when it's a squishy ball is that what you call it okay I'm going to let all of you try it in a minute, okay? Anyway, so what looks, huh, I do. what looks like one thing when you put a little power to it 
something else happens to it, right? Isn't that cool? I thought that was pretty neat. Well, anyway, today what we're talking about is when Jesus went to a place that people didn't expect anything to happen. And Jesus took the power of heaven and the power of love and he brought resurrection to Lazarus. So everybody went thinking they were just going to put flowers on a grave and instead they ended up celebrating Lazarus coming back to life. And it was all a part of the miracle of the power of Jesus to take something that looks like one thing and make it into something else. You know, that's the same thing in your life and my life. You know, if we trust Jesus, if we listen to Him, if we allow Him to work in our lives, He can take something that you might think is going to turn out one way, and He can change it for something a whole lot better. That's what the time with Lazarus, the bringing Lazarus back to life, says to all of us. But it also says one other thing, but we'll talk about that at another point. But that's what I'm going to give you today, to remind you that what things look like, and when you put power to them, they change to something else, and, and it makes like a, a difference ball. in your life. It looks like a squishy ball and when it, you squeeze it. It looks like a squishy ball when you squeeze it. There you go. That's the point of the moment. So let's have a prayer together and thank God for taking the things and changing them from what we expect to what we need. Okay? Dear Jesus, thank you for your power. Thank you for taking the things that that seem like one thing and turning them into something else. Thank you for taking a moment with Lazarus and bringing him back from the grave and showing us life and life without end. Thank you for reminding us of that kind of love. May we live in that, in Jesus' name, amen.
Well, I'm going to do this a little differently this morning. We have an entire uh, clan over here of, uh, of families that are all together and have been a part of our lives for a long time. We watched Josh grow up in this church. His mom and dad helped give us an understanding of missions and of caring for and teaching children in a very special way. And it's something that we'll always be indebted to them for. And out of that, they brought their kids. And when they brought their kids, their boys, then their boys brought bunches of other boys and girls to the church. More girls later on. But anyway, they brought the ones with them to the church. And every time there was a blessing, because as this family has worked together and the families have been intermeshed, Abby's family, Josh's family, Y'all have been intermeshed for all of these years. You've always loved the Lord. You've always taught in church. You've led in music. You've been involved in so many different things. And today, you have this remarkable opportunity to see a grandchild, a great-grandchild, dedicated. Just as you brought other people to church with you, you now bring your own children. And I think that is an absolutely beautiful thing. You both married in the church. You both live in the Spirit of the Lord. You both take parenting very very seriously. And you understand what it means when God gave you the opportunity to have William and to have now Sadie as a part of your lives and to be able to watch them as they grow. You introduce them to the Lord. You introduce them through your spirit, through your love, through your own personal faith and through the practice of that faith. The scripture teaches, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our Lord is one, and you love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And you take that and you teach it to your children, not just on weekends, but every day. As they go out, as they come in, you write it on their heads and their hands and their hearts, and you give them a chance to know the Lord in a precious way. Josh and Abby, I love you. And I'm so excited about what you are doing with these children. And as William came into your life, you began a journey. And as Sadie has come into your life, you advance that journey along. And William, you're going to be the big brother to teach her so many amazing things. And Jesus has never been a stranger to you either. So Sadie, let me introduce you to the people who also will continue to love you and share with you and help you grow in grace and in love. This is your church family. And these people here will love you, and I promise you will do their best never to be a stumbling block in your way. Never. But to love you and take care of you and show you their grace in a special way. Jesus means the world to them, and you mean the world to them. And they want you to know Jesus as they do. And as a family, you're doing that. You're giving them the best, most wonderful opportunity to know what it means to grow in Christ and to live in Him. So now, let's bless Sadie. Let's bless a new William. Let's bless Abby and Josh as together we celebrate this wonderful gift to their lives. Lord Christ, as we come before you, we love this family. We thank you for William and for how he's growing up and what he's learning. We thank you for Josh and Abby and how they love you and serve you. And now, Sadie, we pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you, will make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you, will lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace and his protection and his love. All of your life, may you always feel the embrace of Jesus. In whose name we pray, amen. This is so special. I want to give you, William, you're going to help me with this, right? There you go, buddy. William's my flower carrier today. And we're also going to give you the Bible. And I want to give you the handkerchief so that when she makes her profession of faith in Christ, that she'll have an opportunity to be baptized with that. We love y'all. See you, buddy.
thank you for this special part of your service this morning. Thank you for allowing us to participate in it by giving back a little bit of the blessings you've given to us. We thank you as we look around and see the um, new spring, new life, buds, and the, even the refreshing rain that reminds us of the newness of the Spirit and the coming of the Easter season. They re-reflect that in our lives as Christians. We trust you to bless these offerings to the building of your kingdom. In your name we pray. Amen. I think children should be seen and heard, like these children that are playing in our backyard here. That's why Roxanne and I host the monthly children's Bible study for First Baptist Church. You know, the Bible's for adults, but it's also for children. And the children have a lot to learn. And seeing the Bible through the eyes of children makes me feel closer to God, too. At First Baptist, we're serious about teaching kids the Bible. Bible. Good morning. Welcome to worship with our First Baptist Church family. We're here in beautiful uptown Columbus, Georgia, at a, an incredible season of the year. It's a time when we are seeing life come again to nature around us, but also we're celebrating the new life that we have in Jesus Christ through His death, His burial, and His resurrection. We've been on a journey heading toward that pivotal moment of Easter. And as we've gone along the journey, we've tried to figure out the things that were important to Christ for Him to teach one more lesson, one more opportunity to reveal something about the Father. And today we're talking about how He brought Lazarus back to life. There's a message in that, a message maybe broader than anything we've uh, preached in the past, because it takes us not to just a resurrection, but what's next. I'm glad you've joined us, and it's my prayer that the Lord will bless you and that you will feel very much a part of our church family today. You're in the room with us, you're in our hearts, and you are in the Spirit with us. Thank you for joining us. May God bless you.
I am convinced that there are certain businesses that really need to be very careful about producing cute advertisements. And the funeral industry is one of those. There was an ad that was put on television in Brazil back in 2003 by one of the funeral businesses down there. And it had the tagline at the end of all of its commercials that said, our clients have never come back to complain. <laughs> well, today, this passage is going to fly right in the face of that. Not ostensibly that he came back, that Lazarus came back to complain, but the fact that sometimes a client could come back. This is um, a passage that we find in John 11 beginning with the first verse. John 11, beginning with verse 1. Now, to really cover the text, we need to read all 44 verses. But given the fact that if you'll let me do it, I'll paraphrase part of it so that I don't end up reading all 44 verses. If I don't hear any objections, I'll just do it that way. The account begins with Jesus and his disciples away from Bethany. And they receive word that Jesus' friend Lazarus is really, really ill. And they decide that they are being asked to come for Jesus to be able to be there naturally with his healing ability and with his track record of bringing people through illnesses. They said, please come and help with Lazarus. Well, Jesus didn't go immediately. Because Jesus knew something greater than even the request would, would represent at that point. So what he did was, he tarried a little bit, and they talked about it a little bit, and Jesus finally said, okay, it's time now to go to Lazarus. And they said, well, you know, we've waited. And he said, well, Lazarus, our friend Lazarus has gone to sleep, and I need to go wake him up. And... They said, well, if he's asleep, you know, what does it matter and whatever. And he says, well, he's dead. I need to go now. Well, then they begin to back back a little bit more. If you go, it's going to be a dangerous thing. And it even comes to the point where finally, in verse 16, Thomas, after all the discussion as to whether they should go, whether they shouldn't go, um, how dangerous it would be, and they saw Jesus' complete determination that he was going no matter what, Thomas says this. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Well, he wasn't going to let Jesus go by himself, but he didn't have a good feeling about what was happening. But he still was faithful enough to say, we need to stick with Jesus. We've made a commitment. We need to go with him. Let's see how this thing turns out. But we need to understand that it's dangerous enough that we could all die on this. Verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. That's an appropriate thing that you see happening. People were coming in the middle of the grief to console. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, <clears throat> she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home, probably not wanting to see the way that Martha was just about to treat Jesus, because Martha was not happy that Jesus did not come as quickly as she thought that he should have. And you can almost see her as she goes up to him and puts up that finger and says, If you, he said, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. And then she kind of thinks for a second, backs off and says, But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. So what she's saying is, Jesus, I am really upset with you for not being here when I called you to come. But I have faith that you make up for this and you've got a second chance with me right now. Now that's kind of the spirit. If you know Martha pretty well, you know she's pretty bossy and so that's kind of the spirit that way. But what we see happening in this is that Jesus uses that as an opening 
to transition. It's not about sickness and death. It's not about life and death. It is instead about something spiritual, something more deep than anything that even Martha sees. Remember, Martha's the one who stays in the kitchen and cooks. Mary is the one who listens to the story. Martha is the one who wants everything organized her way, and it has to stay within certain limits. And Mary is the one who says, well, let's see what this is going to look like. So Martha, in her way, needs to hear from Jesus And her response to him is so interesting. It's almost like a catechism where Jesus says something and she gives the proper answer. And he says something else and she gives that proper answer kind of from rote memory. Listen to what it says. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. That's what we've been taught. But you know, this is Lazarus. I know that's going to happen, but I'm not really satisfied with that. I want something now. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? At that moment, he says, look, let's transition. Let's look at this. This is not in your little categories where you have conception and you have life and you have death. Let's knock down all those walls there, and let's begin to look at it in God's greater view of things. You are brought into the world, you are in God's arms and in His love. We see it in Sadie. You see that experience right there. And all through life we continue to transition, and the real goal of all of this is that we have perfect union with Christ Himself. We choose the relationship here by accepting Him as Savior. We enter into that relationship and once we leave this life, we have that perfect relationship with Him in heaven. No more death, no more tears, no more, you know, living with Him forever. And so He's trying to transition this over. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes believes in Me will live even though they die. So hear a hint in there, Martha. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And then he throws it back on her. You've given me the answers. You've given me the right answers. Do you believe this? Put the book down. Look me in the eye. Open your heart and tell me what do you believe? You see, that's the question of the moment. What do you believe? Can you believe in something beyond this moment? Can you believe in something beyond yourself? Can you believe in something beyond something that you are engineering into a greater thing God can do? And she gives him a stock answer. Yes, Lord, I believe you're the Messiah, the Son of God who's come into the world. And then she turns and walks away. Did she roll her eyes as she went? Maybe It wasn't satisfactory, so she goes and gets Mary. She's the dreamy one. She'll be the one to talk about this stuff. So when Mary comes, after Martha said, the teacher is asking for you, which he didn't, but anyway, she knew he wanted her. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews had been with Mary at the house comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out. They followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to mourn there, and they wanted to be there with her. That's admirable. But when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said... Now notice the difference in posture. The other one, as far as we know, was standing there like this. She falls to her knees at his feet. Can you imagine the difference in tone? even though she says the same thing. Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Lord, I know you could have done it. I'm just sorry you weren't here. There's love in there. There is hope in there. Jesus saw her weeping and those who were with her weeping. And he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. 
Come and see, Lord, they replied. And look at verse 35. Everybody knows that verse because it's the shortest verse in the Bible. But I'm going to give you a different translation for it. It says, Jesus wept. We can all quote that. Quote me a scripture. Well, Jesus wept. We've done that, okay? Let's change it. Jesus lost it. Jesus lost it. At that particular moment, everything had been building up to that time. Jesus was there. He knew the Father was doing something in that moment. He saw the grief of those He loved. He was having to defend whether He was there or not. I mean, He was having to deal with that. He comes to that point. He sees the genuineness of Mary's inquiry. He realizes the pain that's there. Lazarus was his friend too. And in that moment, he lost it. I've been in hundreds of situations where there's a strong person standing up for everybody else. A family with a tragedy or a crisis. And there's, I always try to find, there's one person upon whom everyone else is leaning. And at some point, that person has to lose it. That's when they say, give me just a minute, I need to run in here for a second. And they go in and they just melt. And they try to regain their composure and they come back with a renewed strength and are able to go forward. Jesus says it's okay to lose it. Jesus says at that moment, it's the pinnacle. That's the most important moment of all of this. Because we are seeing the heart of God as He looks upon us and He literally loses it. You see, it's easy for us to say, God loved the world so much, He gave us His Son and He died for us and so forth. We almost roll that off our tongues. But what does it do to you when you think about God standing there losing it? That gives you definition to what it means about him giving his life. Then after that comes back, after he recovers from that particular moment, and they are saying, oh, see how he loved him. But some of them were criticizing, couldn't he have opened the, if he opened the blind man's eyes, couldn't he have kept this man from dying? Then in verse 38, Jesus once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance kind of foreshadowing something that we'd see in a couple of weeks. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the practical one, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he's been there four days. This is where I like to go back to the King James. He stinketh, is what the King James says. And as kids, we loved that. Behold, he stinketh. Well, yeah. It's been four days. And they're thinking the, the spirit would hover for three and then the, by the fourth day it had gone on. By this point, something had changed. And Martha wasn't so hept on the idea of seeing how things were there. Then Jesus said, didn't I tell you that if you believe you'd see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. God, this, is, this prayer is for them. We talk about this all the time. You already, I already know what you're doing in me in this moment, but they need to hear the source of this power. They need to hear it. And then when he'd said this, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. One person at the end of the 8.30 service said, you know, if you really look at that, it means not just come out, but come here. Come to me. The dead man came out. His hands and feet were wrapped with strips of linen and cloth around his face. And Jesus said to him, To them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Again, go back to your King James. Loose him and let him go. Now, 
there are a couple of things missing in this. One thing is, he's coming out and nobody makes a move to go and do that until Jesus says, well, you wanted this, he's coming, let's undo him and let him walk because he's barely able to walk with the linen clothes, with the uh, strips on. The other thing you don't see is Lazarus coming out shouting and cheering and saying, I got over death. You don't see that either, do you? Smithsonian ran an article some time back, and, it, and this is the way it was written. By 1.56 p.m., the intensive care unit had tried everything. Aggressive CPR, four shocks to the chest, seven doses of adrenaline, and two bags of fluid. But the 11-month-old girl lay still, her body in cardiac arrest. At 1.58 p.m., after two minutes, flatlining, without a pulse, she was pronounced dead. The family wanted little, a little time to be with the patient, said Louis Darty, the associate professor of pediatrics at the University of Rochester Medical Center, and a member of the team handling the case. After about 15 minutes, the mother asked for the breathing tube to be removed so she could hold her daughter, and then the team witnessed the unimaginable. Soon after the tube was removed, she started to have spontaneous breathing, her heart rate came back, her color improved, she had a gag reflex, said Darty. I've never seen anything like this. It's called the Lazarus Phenomenon, and it only happens very rarely. But it's something that's been around long enough that even in the ancient days, people were afraid of, of death and funerals because they wanted to make, said, if, I, if you think I'm dead, make sure I'm dead. Pour hot water on me, do something. Don't run the risk that I might be able to come back. But it's something that even medical science has seen through the years to some degree. And it was in 1993 that an anesthesiologist gave it that name, the Lazarus Syndrome, or the Lazarus Effect, because of the story of Lazarus. So coming back to life. Did I ever tell you all the time I got blamed for bringing somebody back to life? Did I ever tell you all that? It was interesting. The lady was in a coma and... They had said, nothing's going to happen. They brought the family in and said, Jimmy, we'd like for you to come with us and have a prayer. And so I said, fine. So I did. I went. I've been visiting back and forth. And we stood there and we had a prayer. And she stayed in that, little beeps and all that in the background of the prayer. And over the next couple of days, she kind of lingered there. And one day, she woke up. And she was so mad. She was furious. And they were trying to reason with her, and she was mad with me because she said, I was just about to go. said, I was happy. I was satisfied. And said, then he came, and y'all all prayed, and I came back. She really did. And for a couple of, she lived two more years. And for both of those years, she was mad because she said, I wanted to go on, but I'm back. Now, that added a new dimension to me of this whole moment of the Lazarus thing. Because if you think about it, look in John 12, 9 through 11, what you see. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not because of him, but also to see Lazarus, because he, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. When you come back, does that mean that there's something responsible that you have to do when you come back? Is it more than just saying, Lazarus came forth from the tomb, but is there not also the question of what will he be expected to do now that he's back? And here we see that he's giving witness to the fact of what Jesus had done, and he's getting in trouble for it. And that made, you know the prevailing question that comes up is, what are we going to do with Lazarus now? What are we going to do with Jesus now? And since they couldn't cope with the fact that a miracle had taken place, they said, let's just kill them both. Well, Eugene O'Neill, in his little play, uh, it was kind of on a uh, Greek tragedy kind of uh, way it's written, called Lazarus Laughed, embraces this. He's Lazarus comes back and he says, in heaven, I just remember the laughter of God. When I died, I just remember God's laughter. 
And then he began to see how it was infectious. Anything that happened, he laughed about it. The things that seemed to threaten his life most, he laughed about. When the officials came to him and said, quit talking about this Jesus. And he said, I can't. He did raise me from the dead. And they said, if you don't quit, we're going to kill you. And he started laughing. He says, been there. You know, done that. There was no threat to it anymore. And so the question arises that is really important, and that is, what is next? If something is resurrected, what is it we're supposed to do? The reality of the message surrounding the story of Lazarus is that he was to be revived and to thrive. He was supposed to begin living again, not just to become an icon of a miracle that took place. There had to be some reason. There was some message he had to share, something he needed to do. How could someone take a gift like that and not want to use it in a special way? How could we not take something that was given back to us and not want to do something with it? In the back of the chapel in New, Ox in New College in Oxford, there's a statue of La Lazarus by Jacob Epstein. And the statue is really odd. It's kind of modern, but it shows Lazarus with all the grave clothes on him looking back over his shoulder. And on his face is not a face of victory and joy. It's of a little concern and a little bit anxiety. And he's looking over his shoulder like he's looking back. Maybe he didn't want to come out of the grave Maybe it was a happier thing on the other side. Maybe coming back was going to challenge him with other things that he needed to do. In fact, when he came back, he instantly was threatened. We live in a world where we pronounce so many things dead. Relationships and careers and marriages and futures, hopes and dreams and the like. We pronounce them dead. And in some cases, if we admit it, we'll be glad. Because the responsibility is gone. We don't have to fool with that anymore. And if it were resurrected, we'd have to deal with things that we aren't willing to deal with. And so Jesus steps in and he brings that back. I've seen relationships and careers and marriages and health and other things brought back to life. And when that happened, the first question was, why am I here? What am I supposed to do? In my little lady's life, she was happier going there than she was coming back here because she knew she was going to have other things to deal with and over those two years, she dealt with a lot of things. If someone is worth beginning a relationship, worth, or a relationship is worth creating, or a marriage is worth entering into, or a career is worth training for, or a dream is worth having, we should trust the Lord and follow Him and allow Him to give it life and even bring the life Look at how this process goes. Jesus is away. He comes. He meets the family. He talks with them. He tells them ultimately. He kind of loses it. Then he says, move the stone. He gives them the responsibility to open the path. Then he calls Lazarus out. And then he tells the people to loose him and let him go. How many times have we had someone to have a near-death experience or a bad experience or we've had a career issue or whatever and then we so pamper that moment that we never let it live again we don't let the person live we don't let the career live we don't let the dreams live because we move back and find ourselves in a cautious zone Jesus said turn it loose let it go live and live to the full the fact that Je Lazarus did not come back relieved and that he didn't come back shouting and cheering meant that he was taking seriously what he was going to have to do. He was going to be revived. He was going to thrive. And one day, the full blessing would come and he'd go to heaven and be with Jesus. You see, that's part of the lesson that we have here. The artist's rendition speaks volumes. Marriages are revived or new relationships come in order to take the next steps and truly find joy and to revive. A person who's saved spiritually 
is saved for a full and a meaningful life in Jesus, a person who's given another chance to live has an opportunity to use that life in even a better way. A dream is given another chance, is given a chance to move forward and to dream deeper and broader and to find the joy of that. Another chance in anything should be met with a mixture of fear and hope and responsibility and accountability and vision and purpose. That's what it should be met with. It's not as, as simple as it looks like. Lazarus, come forth. Good. Glad to have you back. Let's get on with life. Lazarus, what are you going to do next? Lazarus, why do you think the Lord brought you back? Lazarus, what is your hope? Let me tell you the story of a friend as I close. A good friend of mine, and he lives in another city. Most of you probably would not know him. Uh, if any of you have met him, it's just in passing. He's one of the happiest people you'll ever meet. Like Lazarus in O'Neill's play, he can laugh about anything. And he's a person that if you knew his story, you'd know that he has a lot of things that happen in his life that he did not need to be able to laugh about. And so I was talking with him, and I actually called him. His story is infectious, and, and the stories that he tells are, are joyful, and they have meaning. And when he has a cause, he'll go for it. And when he has something he can give to, he gives a thousand percent to it. He's as generous a person as you'll ever meet. He's one who has revived and thrived. At one point in his life, he lost his wife to a horrible illness. He lost his dad. He faced some extreme business challenges. And he ended up with a heart condition. And the doctors said if he didn't have surgery, he'd die. And they said, and once you have the surgery, you've got only about seven years. I talked to him this week, 31 years after the doctor told him that. And when I talked to him, I said, tell me about the story. Remind me of it. And he said, well, when all of this stuff was going on, I felt like my life was just totally covered up. And he said, so I went to my pond and I sat on a log. And he said, when I talk to God, I just talk to him like I talk to you. And he said, I'm really honest with him, not pious. And I said, okay. He said, I told God, he said, he said God, I know you've got a gazillion people you have to look after. And you know my name and... I'm sure there's somebody out there with the same name I have. Would you please look at your list and see if I got some of his stuff on my list somehow or another? Because he said, I've been struggling a lot. I've been suffering. And I need your help. He said that day of surrender, everything changed in his life. He began to see things differently. He had his surgery. It went well. And like I said, 31 years later, he is still living. But when he tells you the story, he will tell it with joy and with laughter. He told me about a couple of old men who were in his business one day. And the reason I say that, they were elderly gentlemen who were there. And they were talking. One of them was saying, my back hurts and my leg hurts and I'm just not getting around and I'm this, that, and the other. All these things. And the other one said, well, you ought to be really happy. And the other man said, why would I be happy about that? He said, look, at your age, if you weren't hurting, you'd be dead. <laughs> My friend said, you know, I've learned in all of this that most people celebrate a birthday a year. He said, my birthday is every day I wake up. And he said, I find that my purpose for God bringing me to this next place is for me to have that kind of life. He wasn't just revived, he is thriving. His business did extraordinarily well, and he has become so generous in going and helping other people in education and other places be able to actualize their dreams in ways that he could only do if he were thriving. Instead of living cautiously, I'm just lucky to be here. He's living with abandon. I am living it to the full. Because somehow or another, like Lazarus, he knows what the other side looks like, and that doesn't worry him at all. He literally came back to life and he teaches me and he teaches us all today something about God's goodness and his grace. What in the world could Lazarus have taught us? He could have taught us that you can come back and you can make a difference. 
The real message of the story of Lazarus is that Jesus prayed, called him back, and put him to work, delaying the reward of heaven until a few more things on the list were done. When God revives anything in your life or mine, gives us, any of us, another chance at something, we best ask, why? What next? How does He want to use me? Because in that we find God's greatest dreams for us. What if we became people who truly took, uh, looked at anything that is revived or any blessings from God as a way of God telling us not to just survive but to thrive in it because it's a gift from heaven and it's a purpose from God. Amen. Lord, as we come to you, we understand something about surviving. And sometimes that's as far as our goals go. If I can just get through this, I can survive. May we change our prayer to say, Lord, help me not only to survive, but to thrive in the life you give me, the newness of relationship, the new career, the new possibility, whatever it happens to be. A new child, a new hope a new grace. Be with us, I pray, helping us to learn the difference between just getting by and thriving in you until the day we see you face to face. And that's going to be a really special one. In Jesus' name, amen. Hymn 355 is our hymn of commitment. The doors of the church are open to receive any who feel the Spirit speaking. If God is speaking to you about accepting Him as Savior rededicating your life to Him, renewing your vows before Him to become a part of this church family, whatever it is, as God speaks to you, I'll meet you at the front. As we stand and as we sing together, hymn 355. Be seated for just a moment. Hey guys, thank you. Tucker, Mason, Weddle. We have known these kids before they ever were here. <laughs> they, um, um, John and Carly came into our lives many years ago and became a part of our church family and our hearts in a lot of ways. When John proposed to Carly, he did so right here in this sanctuary. When, <clears throat> when the children came into the world, as they've come into the world, they um, each have been introduced to the Lord and encouraged in their faith experience. Their family is here, including Gigi, 
And they wanted specifically to do this before Gigi went back home because she has been so much a part of their faith journey too. And I think that is wonderful to have their great-grandmother here as a part of this along with grandparents and all the others who were part of this moment. So when they came into, into this life, they began to bring them to church. They come on Sunday morning, and they come to Sunday school, they come to Bible school, they come on Wednesday nights and RAs, all the different things. And they've learned about Jesus. But they, come, they came to a point where they independently, it just happened to merge at the same time, decided they wanted to accept Christ as Savior and wanted to make public their commitment. But both of them wanted me to be clear on the fact that each of them did it separately. And that's an important part for you to know too. But isn't it neat that they got to come down this morning? The only timing difference was so that Gigi would be here. And we wanted to make sure that she got to see this particular moment. So, Tucker, Mason, welcome into the family. Would you join the pastor in welcoming them into the full fellowship of our church upon their baptism by saying amen. amen. This is an example of what it means to be church, what it means to be a Christian family all the way through, and what it means to help instill in them the inquisitive part to ask the questions and the fact part to learn the answers. And they will continue, y'all will continue to grow in Jesus. And they, this group here is going to help you every possible way, okay? okay? I am so proud of them. I wish you could have sat with me when I talked with them. They are so excited, and they know what they're talking about. So, I'm going to ask um, John and Carly if you'll join them at the front door in just a few minutes. Gigi, why don't you go out there too with them? And the rest of y'all go too, because I, I want everybody to hug your neck too, because you got to see this. And just take the whole crew out there, okay? Now, I will send you off with Mr. Myron, okay? There you go. There you go. Thank you. Isn't that neat? Well, as you prepare to go from this place, I'll ask you to stand for our benediction. Let's give them just a little second or two to be able to get up the aisle. Sadie's still up. No, Sadie. Yeah, Sadie's still up here, so you can come. You get a chance to see Sadie and hug her, too, at the part thing. Now, in both of those boys' lives, by the way, we'll have handkerchiefs from the dedication up here of both of those, and we'll use those in their baptism, which again reminds you of the trail of faith exploration with the family, and that's beautiful. Now, as you go, God will bless you again and again and again. He has already blessed you in many ways. So many of you have had second chances in health and life and relationship and careers and possibilities. So many of you are right on the cusp of what God's going to do next in your life. And when He does, He whispers two things to you. To be revived and now to thrive. And the way we thrive is in our faith and love of Jesus. And so as you go, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace as you thrive. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen.